Thank you and hello again for the third time this morning. So earlier we talked about the ventilator circuit and some of the technical details related to invasive mechanical ventilation. Now I want to talk about some of those same issues as they relate to non-invasive ventilation. Here again are my disclosures, exactly the same as they were for the previous two talks. A few years ago, there were some very important clinical practice guidelines published related to non-invasive ventilation. Uh, at least I think that they are important, partly because I was one of the co-authors of this document. But as we were putting together these guidelines, one of the things that we discussed among ourselves is the fact that often the success or failure of non-invasive ventilation relates to the technical aspects of its application at the bedside. And in fact, we wrote a parallel document to these clinical practice guidelines related to some of those technical aspects, some of the things I will talk about this morning. We asked the editor if he would consider publishing two documents, the clinical practice guidelines as well as the technical aspects, and the response was, no, but I will allow you to publish this as supplementary material with the guidelines. So we did that. So if you click online to the supplementary material, you will see that the supplementary material includes a technical aspect or a technical summary of the practical application of non-invasive ventilation in the hospital setting. So I would refer you to that document. I think that it has gotten pretty much buried in the literature. However, there are a number of practical points that we make in that document about the bedside use of non-invasive ventilation, some of which I will talk with you about this morning. If we look at the circuit that is used for non-invasive ventilation, there are fundamentally three types of different circuits that might be used. One might use a single limb passive circuit as is illustrated here. And with this type of circuit and ventilator, it is important that there is a leak port that is incorporated into the circuit that leak port can either be in the circuit near the mask, or in some applications, the leak port is within the mask itself. And for ventilators that are designed primarily for non-invasive ventilation, they often use this type of configuration. And there are some issues related to that as we'll talk about over the next minutes. One can also use a single limb active circuit where there is an active exhalation valve with the active exhalation valve near the mask, near the interface. This sometimes is used for non-invasive ventilation, but one of the issues is the weight of the exhalation valve attached to the mask, which can affect the mask fit. And then one can also use a dual limb circuit for non-invasive ventilation if one uses a critical care ventilator and indeed virtually all of the current generation critical care ventilators have non-invasive ventilation modes. They use a dual limb circuit and the issues that I discussed earlier this morning with dual limb circuits and invasive ventilation would apply here as well. Now, one of the issues that was identified first 25 or more years ago with the use of a single limb passive circuit is the potential for rebreathing. Because what can happen is if the exhaled breath of the patient exceeds the ability of the leak port to accommodate, to accommodate that exhaled breath, the patient can potentially exhale into the circuit and then rebreathe carbon dioxide on the subsequent inhalation. Certainly, I'm sure we would all agree that in a patient with hypercapnic respiratory failure, we would prefer that the patient does not rebreathe 
their exhaled carbon dioxide. So how can we get around that potential problem? Well, one thing that we can do is to just maintain an expiratory pressure of at least four centimeters of water. By providing an expiratory pressure of at least four centimeters of water, there is sufficient flow through the circuit to flush any carbon dioxide that might accumulate in the circuit before the patient's subsequent inhalation. And in fact, many ventilators designed specifically for non-invasive ventilation that use a passive port, passive leak port such as this, will not allow the expiratory pressure to be set to less than four centimeters of water. So if you've ever wondered why your BiPAP machine does not allow you to decrease the EPAP to less than four, the reason is to avoid rebreathing. If we increase the leak in the system, that will also flush carbon dioxide from the circuit because more flow will be necessary to compensate for the leak. If we put the leak port in the mask rather than in the hose, that will decrease the amount of rebreathing. Or we could use an active exhalation valve because the real advantage of the active exhalation valve such as we use in ICU ventilators, is that it prevents rebreathing. There are a number of ventilators now that can be used for non-invasive ventilation. I typically group those into bi-level devices, intermediate devices, and critical care devices. The bi-level devices use a passive circuit, such as was illustrated on the previous slide. The intermediate devices can use either an active or a passive circuit, and the critical care devices use a dual limb circuit, and as I pointed out previously, now many of the current generation critical care ventilators have non-invasive ventilation modes. Now, one of the things that is important to appreciate during non-invasive ventilation is asynchrony. Asynchrony is certainly an important issue during invasive ventilation, also an important issue during non-invasive ventilation. And I wrote a review now a number of years ago about issues related to asynchrony during non-invasive ventilation. And on this table from the paper are listed many of the factors that can contribute to asynchrony during non-invasive ventilation. And the most important is the ability of the ventilator to deal with unintentional leaks. So by its very nature, non-invasive ventilation uses a leaky interface a face mask, and how well the ventilator can deal with leaks, unintentional leaks in the system, will be a big contributor to asynchrony. This was nicely described in this paper, which was both a bench study and a clinical study, published more than five years ago, now in CHEST. And what these authors found was looking at the number of asynchronies, there are differences between ventilators designed specifically for non-invasive ventilation, ICU ventilators with a non-invasive ventilation mode, ICU ventilators without a non-invasive ventilation mode. And one of the most important messages from this paper is that ventilators designed specifically for non-invasive ventilation uh, deal much better with leak, and by dealing much better with leak, the number of asynchronies are much lower. However, if we look at critical care ventilators, some of the critical care ventilators with a non-invasive ventilation mode actually also perform quite well as far as leak compensation and reducing the number of asynchronies but you can appreciate that there's a lot of variability between ventilators. So some critical care ventilators deal with leaks very well, 
and their ability to uh, allow for good synchrony between the patient and the ventilator is nearly as good as ventilators designed specifically for non-invasive ventilation. But others are much poorer at dealing with leak and issues of asynchrony. I actually wrote an editorial to go with this paper along with Richard Branson, and we thought that we came up with a clever title for the editorial, Know Your Ventilator to Beat the Leak, uh, meaning that some ventilators compensate for leak very well, and in that way, there are few asynchronies. Other ventilators do not deal with leak nearly as well, and there is a greater potential for asynchrony. Now, just as we need to consider issues of humidification with invasive ventilation that I talked about earlier this morning, we also need to consider issues related to humidification during non-invasive ventilation. And with non-invasive ventilation, we don't have to worry about issues such as occlusion of the endotracheal tube, which is a concern during invasive ventilation. The primary reason why we need to concern ourselves with humidification during non-invasive ventilation is for patient comfort. If you have ever yourself tried to breathe a dry gas, you know how uncomfortable that can be. And patient comfort during non-invasive ventilation is often improved by heating and humidifying the gas delivery. However, we do not need to increase the humidification all the way to 100% body humidity. We do not need to deliver a gas which is at a temperature of 37 degrees at 100% relative humidity as we do with invasive ventilation. For non-invasive ventilation, uh, typically a temperature of about 30 degrees centigrade is sufficient and we can, just as we do with invasive ventilation, we can heat the circuit to reduce condensation. One can also use passive humidifiers during non-invasive ventilation, but I think there are some issues with doing that. First of all, the passive humidifier adds dead space into the circuit, as we had talked about earlier this morning. And it also adds resistance into the circuit, which may contribute to a poor patient ventilator uh, interaction. I think generally during non-invasive ventilation, uh, the passive humidifier is less efficient uh, with a nasal interface and with leaks because in order for the passive interface to work appropriately, the patient needs to breathe in and out through the device and with leaks, the patient may breathe in through the device, may breathe out through a leak, for example, in through the nose, out through the mouth, which defeats the performance of the passive humidifier. There have been, over the years, a number of studies that have evaluated the use of passive humidifiers during non-invasive ventilation. Most of these were physiologic studies. There was one randomized controlled trial, as we will look at in a minute. And this study now, more than 50, published more than 15 years ago, compares a heat and moisture exchanger to a heated humidifier, either with zero PEEP or with PEEP added to the circuit, looking at work of breathing. And you can see that the work of breathing is significantly lower and in fact, in some patients, substantially lower using a heated humidifier rather than a heat and moisture exchanger. And I think the reason for that reduction in the work of breathing is because of the dead space and the resistance that are in the heat and moisture exchanger, which are eliminated with the use of the active heated humidifier. This is another study actually by the same group published about 10 years ago, looking at the effect of leak during non-invasive ventilation with the use of a heat and moisture exchanger versus with a heated humidifier. And you can see with the heated humidifier, if there are leaks, 
the delivered humidity remains relatively constant. However, with the heat and moisture exchanger, if there embargo, are leaks, the there de is a substantial humedad, decrease in the amount of humidity that is delivered. De Again, this is because the performance of the heat and moisture exchanger requires that the patient breathe in and out through the device. And if there are leaks in the, in the system, si that defeats sistema, the performance pues, of the heat and moisture exchanger. Del intercambiador, pues no tendría caso. Del this is a paper again by the same group that looked at the effect of a heat and moisture exchanger versus a heated, heated humidifier on arterial PCO2 in patients with COPD exacerbation. And what they found was that in many patients, if you look at the data here, in many patients, there was no difference in PCO2. However, you can also see that in some patients, there were important decreases in PCO2 when going from a heated humidifier to a heat, or when going from a heat and moisture exchanger to a heated humidifier, there is significant reductions in PCO2. And again, I think this relates to the fact that with the heat and moisture exchanger, there is more dead space in the circuit. That increase in dead space can result in a higher PCO2. Now, does that translate into differences in patient outcomes? And the answer is perhaps not. So this is a randomized controlled trial, again, by Laloche, who has published much of the work in this area. So this was a randomized controlled trial comparing the use of heat and moisture exchanger versus heated humidifier during non-invasive ventilation. And as you can see, looking at outcomes like survival, absolutely no difference between the two devices. So I think in many patients, either device could be used. However, it's important to consider the technical aspects of the device that I, as I've illustrated in previous slides, uh, previous slides that show that in some patients, uh, perhaps the heat and moisture exchanger is not the most appropriate choice, particularly in patients who may have a high PCO2 or where there are high uh, degrees of leak in the system. I want to make just a few comments about the interface because the interface I view as part of the circuit during non-invasive ventilation. As you know, there are many, many styles of interfaces that we can choose from in our practice. There are interfaces that are available from probably dozens of manufacturers, lots of different choices for interface drawing non-invasive ventilation. I think that the evidence would support that for acute care applications, so for acute COPD, for example, the use of an oronasal mask or a total face mask is more appropriate. And the reason for that is that mouth leak can be quite problematic in patients with acute respiratory failure and the use of an interface fitting over the nose and the mouth effectively eliminates that problem. One of the issues that we need to deal with as it relates to the interface is skin breakdown. So we want to be sure to use a correctly fitted mask, using a mask of the wrong size, either too large or too small, will result in the mask needing to be strapped more tightly, and that contributes to skin breakdown. It is important to adjust the headgear appropriately, not to strap the mask too tightly, to use forehead spacers to decrease the amount of pressure on the bridge of the nose. Sometimes an effective strategy is to rotate interfaces. So to use one type of interface for one part of the day 
another type of interface for another part of the day. And that also relates to the issue of rotating interfaces. So using different types, rotating the types, removing the mass for short periods if the patient tolerates that. And then using hydrocolloid dressings on the face, particularly over pressure points, such as on the cheeks, on the bridge of the nose, to decrease the amount of skin breakdown. One of the things that has been appreciated in recent years is that some types of interfaces contribute to greater degrees of skin breakdown than others. This is one paper looking at total face mask versus an oronasal mask, and in this study they reported that the odds of developing skin breakdown were more than 80 times greater if an oronasal mask was used rather than a total face mask. So what is a total face mask? Well, these, these are pictures of total face masks that are commercially available. And again, the evidence suggests that with these types of devices, facial skin breakdown might be significantly lower than using a traditional oral facial mask. Mouth leak can be problematic. I think the way that we usually deal with that is by using an oral nasal mask or a total face mask. We can try to coach the patient to keep their mouth closed. That can be difficult. In a dyspneic patient with acute respiratory failure, we can try to use a chin strap in patients with acute respiratory failure. I found that that often is not very effective. Now, let's take a few minutes and talk about aerosol delivery during non-invasive ventilation. So earlier this morning, we talked about aerosol delivery during invasive ventilation. Now, let's talk about aerosol delivery during non-invasive ventilation because the issues are different and some of the clinical applications are also different. So again, illustrated here are the primary types of circuits that we may use for non-invasive ventilation. The passive circuits, as we might use at the bi-level or a BiPAP device, and an active circuit, as we might use with a critical care ventilator. If we use a critical care ventilator and a dual limb active circuit for non-invasive ventilation, aerosol delivery issues are similar to what I described this morning during invasive ventilation. However, if we use a passive circuit with a leak port, either a leak port in the circuit or a leak port in the mask, that has important implications for aerosol delivery. For example, if we go back to the, our interfaces that I showed previously, the three interfaces for which we might use for aerosol delivery are the oronasal mask, the nasal mask, the mouthpiece, and the total face mask. Oh, excuse me, I, I take that back. For non-invasive ventilation, we should use the oronasal mask, the nasal mask, the mouthpiece. We should not use the total face mask or the helmet because the issue with aerosol delivery with a total face mask or a helmet is getting aerosol into the eyes of the patient. So when we think then about interfaces for non-invasive ventilation and aerosol delivery, we should limit, I believe, the aerosol delivery primarily to oronasal mask, nasal mask, and mouthpieces. We should avoid total face mask and helmets for aerosol delivery because of the increased likelihood of the positive depositing the aerosol into the eyes of the patient. For aerosol delivery during non-invasive ventilation, we could, we could use a pressurized meter dose inhaler with a spacer device, as is shown here. 
we could use a jet nebulizer or we could use a mesh nebulizer. In each case, notice that the device is attached directly to the interface. So that is an important difference between aerosol delivery with invasive versus non-invasive ventilation. So earlier this morning with invasive ventilation, I had said to place the nebulizer closer to the ventilator. However, evidence supports that for non-invasive ventilation, we should place the aerosol delivery device closer to the interface, whether we're using a meter dose inhaler with spacer, a jet nebulizer, or a mesh nebulizer. There is Physiologic data, such as from this study published a few years ago, that with non-invasive ventilation, we can effectively deliver aerosols. In this study, it was reported that improvements in measures such as FEV1 and peak flow were significantly greater with non-invasive ventilation and a nebulizer used in line than with the nebulizer by itself without non-invasive ventilation. And these were patients with severe acute asthma. So you can see that these patients had FEV1s of around 45 to 50%. So, uh, so, so moderately severe uh, acute asthma. So this study suggests that non-invasive ventilation can be, excuse me, that aerosol delivery can be effectively used during non-invasive ventilation and results in a significant improvement in measures of airflow obstruction. These are some data from my laboratory that we published in Critical Care Medicine a long time ago. We did this study uh, almost 20 years ago. And the question that we had in this, in doing this study, was whether it mattered if we placed the nebulizer at the outlet of the ventilator or the bypass machine or if we placed the nebulizer between the leak port and the attachment of the patient to the face mask. And what we found surprisingly was there was significantly more aerosol available to the patient if the nebulizer was placed near the position of the face mask than if the nebulizer was placed near the ventilator. So this is the opposite of what I told you earlier about aerosol delivery during invasive ventilation. So with invasive ventilation, we want to place the nebulizer at the outlet of the ventilator. But with non-invasive ventilation, we want to place the nebulizer between the leak port and the face mask. Now, why is that? Well, the reason for that primarily is because of the leak in the circuit. And in fact, if we place the nebulizer near the outlet of the ventilator, a lot of the aerosol that is delivered into the circuit ends up leaking out of the leak port. So rather than the aerosol being delivered to the patient, it is lost to the room. It goes into the room rather than being delivered to the patient. So again, we want to place the nebulizer during non-invasive ventilation. With the passive circuit, we want to place the nebulizer near the patient rather than near the ventilator. Now with non-invasive ventilation, the, with a passive circuit, the leak port might either be in the circuit or the leak port might be in the mask. So this is another study that we did and published uh, more than 10 years ago, looking at the amount of albuterol aerosol delivery with a nebulizer versus with a pressurized meter dose inhaler if the leak port is in the circuit versus the mask. And what we found was that when the leak port was in the circuit, the amount of aerosol delivered from the nebulizer and the meter dose inhaler with the spacer was virtually identical. 
However, when the mass leak was, or excuse me, when the leak was in the mask, when the leak was in the mask, the efficiency of the meter dose inhaler with the spacer was significantly greater than a nebulizer. So these data might suggest that if you are using as the interface a mask with a leak port, that the aerosol delivery might be better with a pressurized meter dose inhaler. <clears throat> One can also use a mesh nebulizer. There are now commercially available mesh nebulizers that incorporate directly into the mask, and there's evidence to suggest that these are a very effective way of delivering aerosols during non-invasive ventilation. The point, again, that I would make is that the nebulizer is near the mask, in this case incorporated into the mask, rather than positioned at the outlet of the ventilator. One thing that is very important to appreciate when delivering aerosols during non-invasive ventilation is that there's the potential for the aerosol to be delivered into the eye of the patient. So this is a case that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine a number of years ago, reporting a patient who developed unilateral pupillary dilation. Uh, they thought the patient was having an acute neurologic event, but as it turned out, the pupillary dilation was the result of a leak of aerosol from around the mask into the patient's eye. And in this case, the patient was receiving uh, uh, both an anticholinergic and a beta agonist, and that resulted in them believing, at least for a short time, that the patient may have been having an acute neurologic event. So when we deliver aerosols during non-invasive ventilation, it's important that we do things like position the leak port to minimize that the aerosol could go into the patient's eyes. In summary, leak during non-invasive ventilation affects rebreathing, synchrony, humidification, and aerosol delivery, and we touched on some of those issues. I think that humidification is important during non-invasive ventilation for patient comfort, and aerosols can be effectively delivered during non-invasive ventilation. But again, I would make the point that with invasive ventilation, the nebulizer goes at the outlet of the ventilator, with non-invasive ventilation, the nebulizer goes at the position of the mask. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions.